What's going on Neon Nation? Welcome back to the Neon Arcade for your weekly Cyberpunk 2077 news. Today we're talking about a lot of exciting Cyberpunk 2077 details including just what kind of different open world activities, random encounters, quests and side jobs you can do in Night City, some beautiful new screenshots from CD Projekt Red, some details on the district of Watson with some screens and concept art of this melting pot district, as well as a ton of unique details you may have missed from previews and hands-on events. Get 15% off high quality metal art from Displate featuring officially licensed designs. Check out the link in the pinned comment and the description. Before we get into it, check out this response to Kanye West's announcement that he's running for presidency of the United States by the Cyberpunk 2077 Twitter page. As we know, Cyberpunk 2077 is based on the dark future of Cyberpunk 2020, so they decided to respond with, so this is how it started, insinuating that a Kanye presidency is this timeline's beginning of the dark future. Definitely some pretty on-brand humor from CDPR, which I think we can all agree was a top-tier tweet. Now first up, we have a feature from CDPR on the District of Watson. They explain the district as follows. Watson used to have it all. Nightclubs, skyscrapers, corporate offices, a top-end med center, even the biggest black market in Night City. Japanese corporations competing with Arasaka invested billions of euro dollars in the district, intending to make it self-sufficient and prosperous. Everything changed when Arasaka returned to the city after the Unification War. It bled other corporations dry and changed Watson forever. Without a stable financial sector, Watson's glory days ended. The Northside Industrial District, once a cutting-edge technology park, could no longer provide jobs, leaving people out on the streets. This economic vacuum allowed Arasaka to take over and make Watson its own. In the end, Arasaka got what it wanted, port access and the waterfront. Today, Watson is a sad and desperate place. It's one of Night City's poorest districts, and it's a battleground between the Maelstrom and Tiger Claws. Maelstrom settled in the Northside Industrial District. It's filled with factories and working class apartment blocks. You can also find the well-known Totentans bar here. Tiger Claws operate from Little China and Kabuki. Little China used to be an extension of downtown. It's a high density urban region with skyscrapers overpopulated with Asian immigrants during the late 2040s. You can also find the old Med Center here. It used to be the best place in Night City to legally spend some money on your body, but now it's overrun by the Kabuki market. Kabuki is a maze of narrow alleyways located right next to Little China. At night, they turn into a bazaar for implants, organs, steroids, and much more. Legend is that you can find anything you're looking for in a kabuki market. This makes Watson a prime target for the scabs, a ruthless group of people who harvest people's organs and implants for resale on the black market. The rest of Watson is the Arasaka waterfront, an area off limits for non-employees. Now there are definitely some new pieces of lore here that bridge Cyberpunk 2020 and Red's timeline with the events prior to 2077. First we learn about the Unification War which has resulted in Arasaka becoming prominent in Night City again. If you guys remember in the 2020s, Arasaka was banished and Militech was nationalized post-destruction of Arasaka Towers, City Center and much of the area around it by the Mini Nuke. It seems like with the Unification War, Arasaka is now a malignant entity in Watson, sucking up most of the resources and as mentioned in the snippet, bleeding the area dry. The concept art shown here seems to be a mix of all the visual styles blended together, with Neo Kitsch, Neo-militarism, entropism, and kitsch all having their architectural presence felt from the skyline angle. Moving on, we have some of the open world activities that were noted by journalists who had the chance to go hands-on with Cyberpunk 2077. Some playtesters wrote down each of the open world elements as a comprehensive list, and although there could be actually more than this, this is a really good sign to the diversity of things to do in Night City. Going down the list, we have main jobs and side jobs, gun for hire or mercenary quests, search and recovery quests, Thievery, Agent Saboteur, and SOS quests, Mercs Needed, Special Deliveries, Assaults in Progress, Cyber Psycho Sightings, Clothing Stores, Ripper Docks, Techies, Weapons and Gun Shops, Trainers, Foods and Restaurants, Bars, and other side quests. The open world team has most definitely been working hard since they were formed post Witcher 3 to fill this world with meaningful and exciting content that will hopefully add to the feeling of Night City being a bustling dangerous metropolis which you start to carve your path through. Layer on the deep RPG elements of Street Cred, catch-up mechanics, weapon stat boosts, loot drops, cyberware upgrades, perks and skills, and this game is looking to be something where you have agency over a ton of elements. Now when it comes to previews, we have some additional things that I haven't talked about in my prior video coverage of the previews coming from a stream with Alana Pierce and three other journalists who played the game. I'll have a link in the description as this hour and 15 minute discussion does have some great topics. I did write down some of the standout elements I hadn't heard before, so let's go through them. During the Nomad playthrough, there was a segment where the Snake Nation was mentioned. Now we know the Wraiths and the Aldecaldos are the Nomad factions that have been confirmed for Cyberpunk 2077, 
but hearing a reference to the Snake Nation might give some insight into them showing up at some point during the game. The Snake Nation in 2020 was the largest nomad nation that was created as a response to the nomad movement in North America, led by a man named Freddie Douglas. Now during the Nomad Life Path preview, there was a section where we had to smuggle something into Night City. According to the discussion here, it turns out this was actually an iguana, who in this timeline are rare because they've gone extinct for over 30 years. This iguana is actually property of Arasaka, and thus you get upended by them, attempting to bring this reptile across the border. As a side note, you can allegedly also pet the iguana and he climbs all over you, so for animal and reptile fanatics, I'd imagine this life path might be more interesting based on this. At 26 minutes in, Alana mentions that a redhead told her about a Forza 4 style driving build for vehicles. This was not available in the preview build that they were given, and the red mentioning this had expressed that he had wished that it was in this particular build. For those who were concerned about the driving, this is a response which might alleviate some of your concerns. Now we've all seen the Maelstrom 48 minute demo and again a red mention to Alana on her playthrough that there were 7 different outcomes of that particular quest. This is insane for the potential of branching narratives, replayability and repercussions to your actions. One scenario ended with Militech storming the lair and fighting the Maelstrom as you simply looked on. Some of the loot they found included condoms, burritos and handcuffs and when it comes to loot there will be a sell all junk button to streamline the selling process at vendors and stores. When it comes to melee and boxing, there was a questline which starts off with a training robot in your apartment. After you've completed that, you will move on to a kind of street brawling tournament which begins with fighting the oscillation sync twins in Kabuki. You'll progress to tougher opponents in a similar style to the boxing tournaments from The Witcher. The cover system was also compared to Wolfenstein's and the consensus was that it actually felt really good despite it not being a super standout feature. Finally, when it comes to the biochip The Relic, it was mentioned that this is experimental tech which is used to transfer a dying person's consciousness into. There's a TV talk show in the world where Arasaka employees were discussing the morality and ethics of the Relic chip. It was allegedly created to house the leader of Arasaka's consciousness. This explains why Silverhand, who died at the hands of Adam Smasher, is on the chip and parts of the end of the Cyberpunk 2020 timeline. Some super interesting details, especially if you're versed with the lore, so for that discussion, again, there will be a link in the description, along with Arasaka and Nomad lore, which will help you dive deep into some of the points made above. Moving on, check out some of these screenshots via various outlets and CD Projekt Red themselves. We have a look at one of the Arasaka katanas being used to deflect bullets from these street thugs, one of the outcomes of the Maelstrom mission with these Militech soldiers getting involved in the fray, the outside of an Arasaka mega building with troopers shutting off the road, a screenshot of the sheriff out in the Badlands utilizing ray tracing, and the Street Kid backstory featuring this Arasaka corporate higher up. Now, I personally think they all look great, with my only beef so far in the visual design being these Militech soldiers. Honestly, they just look like mushrooms and I can't get the image out of my head, but hey, that's just me. We also have this snapshot of all the Life Path starting outfits, as well as this comparison from this vantage point of Night City from 2018 to 2020, so drop a comment and let me know which one you guys prefer. Moving on, yes, Japan has decided to censor Cyberpunk 2077 as they are fairly strict with their movies and games. The Japanese version will receive the following changes. Added underwear to naked male and female characters, selective revision of severing human bodies and exposed guts, revision and removal of billboard and graffiti shaped as genitals, as well as a revision of some sexually suggested content. If you are in Japan, you're going to want to find a workaround for this, as this, no pun intended, really guts what makes Cyberpunk 2077 stand out, as well as many of the world building elements of overt in your face marketing and the themes of the body no longer being sacred. Moving on, we have an interview with the lead graphics programmer Marcin Goyent, confirming that Cyberpunk 2077 will run exclusively on DirectX 12 on the PC. This allows for upper end graphics and effects like ray tracing and ultra realism, as well as enables higher frame rates but it does so with a reliance on mid to upper GPUs really pushing modern PC hardware to its limits. If you have a DirectX 12 compatible GPU, you are in the clear, but if you don't, you might want to consider an upgrade. DX12 was launched in 2015, so if you do have a card from the last 5 years, you should be good to go, but it's always good to double check if you're unsure. As always, thank you guys for watching, and for more Cyberpunk, join Neon Nation by subscribing to the Neon Arcade.